Hey guys and welcome back to another card review. This time we're going to take a look at part 2 of Fall of Everlife. Now I know this is a little later than my first part, but I feel that this part of the expansion uh, had a lot more to offer in terms of uh, deck building and the cards had more synergy together, so I felt that I needed the time to try them out. If you've been watching my Will It Works, I've been trying out a lot of the different subtypes from the Rakoans to the Yaks to the Beasts, so there's lots of different subtypes there and I felt like I needed to explore them before I could really give my thoughts on uh, how I feel about the cards uh, because they require synergies in order to be used. Uh, with the first part of Fall of Everlife, uh, a lot of the cards have quite good standalone cards, so it's much easier to gauge their kind of power level uh, off the bat and how they helped existing archetypes, whereas this part created new archetypes with its cards. So let's get to it then, let's get into the review and I'll go through the cards and tell you what I think. Alright guys, to kick things off, we are going to talk about the Rakoans. Now I would start up here, but I'm actually going to start at the bottom because this is kind of what ties the whole deck together, uh, the whole subtype together. So the first Rakoan up is the Rakoan War Leader. Combat, give a random Rakoan in your hand, plus one, plus one. Two lands, four Faria, three five, not bad stats, pretty reasonable cost. Uh, and then it has an ability that empowers Rakoans in your hand. Now. I am very unimpressed with this card personally uh, because it doesn't offer doesn't offer m much interest to me in its ability. It's just powering up Rakoans. Not that interesting of an ability, whereas some of the other Rakoans have really strong and cool abilities. This is one of the uh, one of the more tamer uh, abilities in its combat. And to be honest, like it's a free five for four fairies, it's pretty decent. But I feel like it takes up precious slots in a Rakoan themed deck. There's a lot of Rakoans to choose from that are not featured in Fall of the Everlife, but also in previous expansions like the Oversky. We have stuff like Frog Tosser, Rakoan Reveler. Those two cards alone are fantastic. Rakoan War Chief for me, um, War Leader, sorry, is just, it doesn't do enough. It just empowers Rakoans by plus one, plus one, but essentially giving them a campfire in hand, and you have to be in combat in order to pull this off. Now, other people might enjoy this card more, or may find a deck type where it suits, but for me personally, it feels like the least impactful as far as the Rakoan synergies go. So I, I'm not a big fan of War Leader. You guys might like it, but for me, it doesn't do much. Now, on the other hand, the Rakoan War Machine, I'm a big fan of. This card is really cool. So it's a 4 Feria, 1 Lake, 1 Mountain, 4-4 four, four, with Charge 2. So straight away, this card is mobile. It's a 4-4 four, four mobile creature. It is very similar to that of the Gabrian Archon. So it has that Charge 2. It has a good stat line as well. Very solid stat line for its cost. 4 attack, 4 life. Big fan of that stat line in Feria. We've seen very powerful creatures in the past like Triton Warriors. Herald of War, Mace Man, all these guys are 4-4s four and they've done very well in Feria. Now its other ability is very interesting. This may swallow another friendly Rakoan to gain plus 2 plus 0. Now what I really like about this ability is one, it scales it up to 6 attacks so it can challenge stuff like Ancient Herald, it can challenge stuff like Grove Guardian which has picked up in popularity thanks to Beasts, but also Ground Shakers. Killing Ground Shakers, you know how you guys know how much I hate Ground Shaker. I can take care of Ground Shaker with this. All right, I'll be I'll be real. Ground Shaker is not as bad as it used to be. I actually I quite like Ground Shaker in its current state, but yeah, being able to kill a Ground Shaker is fantastic. Now the second kind of trick with the Swallow ability is why I like this card so much. So let's say you have a Rakoan in a position where it can get cleared next turn or it's not safe and you need to get it out of dodge, you need to get it out of the danger zone. Rakoan War Machine has Swallow which is a global ability which means you can do it on target anything on the, on the field. So you target that Rakoan in danger, you swallow it and then it's out of danger and then you have this Rakoan in the War Machine for when it dies. So you get another creature once that War Machine dies. And I remember I had a game where I had a Rakoan champion hit in face and my opponent played like a taunt which was bigger than my Rakoan champion and I was able to swallow at the War Machine and use that champion later on. Fantastic. So big fan of this one. Rakoan Recruiter. Now a 4 Feria, 1-1, one, one. you can see a theme going on with these guys. A 3-4. 
add a 1-1 one, one, as a gift, so when you play it, add a 1-1 one, one Rokoan to your hand, it costs zero. Now, this isn't a very like, exciting ability, but what I really like about it is it helps you spawn more Rokoans, so it l lets you play towards your win condition like Rokoan Champion, but it also enables you to have targets for other Rokoan cards, like the Rokoan Cannoneer and also the Rokoan Illusionist. So this is why I like this card. It's not particularly exciting, but it does open up options for Rokoans. There are, there's this theme around some of the cards where you get to transform or swallow or uh, remove your Rokoans in order to get additional abilities. And Rokoan Recruiter is just very good at that. And a zero cost 1-1, one, one. That's, a, that's, a that's a good value, you know, gaining that extra 1-1 one, one stat. So this technically represents a 4-5 four, for 4 Faria, but you get that 1-1 one, one that can also collect for you. You can play it like a farm boy, you can stick to the one side and collect in safety. Uh, you can use it for those abilities. Uh, there's just lots you can do with this 1-1, one, one. and it might, like I said, the ability is quite simple, but it has great synergy with the Rokoan tribe. So I'm very happy about this card. I think it's fantastic. And I think it could feature in other decks as well. If you just want a solid four, four cost creature, gain that extra 1-1, one, one, which is neutral, and you can play it somewhere else in safety to Harvest Faria. Now, speaking about the effects which target Rokoans, Rokoan Cannoneer is one of my favorite new Rokoans as well. A free Faria, one mountain, one desert, free two. Gift, you may sacrifice a Rokoan, if you do, deal free damage. Now this free damage can go anywhere. So it's a bit like a flame burst. Go face, hit creatures, hit structures. Lots of utility built into the Cannoneer. You also have synergies with the Rokoan uh, Recruiter using those one ones. You can also use Rokoan Revler, which is also a red creature. Sack that, gain some Faria back, and then you also get to deal free damage. So lots of uh, cool applications for a Cohen Cannoneer, uses removal, helps you trade, help you clear something, very good, very versatile, like this card a lot. Now Rokoan Shield Mates, this is a card that's not only just featuring in Rokoan decks, but also featuring Green Yellow Sacrifice. We've seen this turn up in Green Yellow Sacrifice decks, there's a very big buff to that. So two Faria, one Forest, one Desert, see a theme going on here. A last word, summoning 1-1 one, one recall where this died. So the good thing about this card straight up is its value. It's a 2 Faria 2-2. Two, two. Great stats for its cost. Also has a 1-1 one, one hidden inside it when it dies. So you get an additional creature which means it takes a little extra to clear. So this card generates a lot of value on its own but when you combo it with other cards like the Cannoneer or the Illusionist uh, or even um, even like a Green Elf Sacrifice deck, sacking it and then just getting the 1-1 one, one back. Uh, which actually you couldn't do that, that just wouldn't work, don't ignore that. Sacking the 1-1 one, one that comes from it, you can do that, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, this card is really strong, mainly in Sacrifice decks. I feel this could have a place in the Rakoan decks, but I feel this card actually benefits Green Elf Sacrifice more. You get more targets that die, more targets that power up that Soul Eater and that Bone Collector, and just more targets to sacrifice. Can't go wrong with the shield mates, probably one of the best for Cohen's out of all of them, simply for its uh, synergy with a pre-existing archetype which was very strong in the Oversky. Alright, so Rakoan Illusionist, 2 Faria, 1 Lake, 1 Desert. It's a 1-1, one, one, not great stats, but has a cool gift. Transform another friendly Rakoan into a 4-4 fly and charge to June Drake. Bit of a mouthful there, until the start of your next turn. So you're going to basically just gain a June Drake. Uh, your Rakoan will transform back if it lives on the following turn, so keep that in mind. The great thing about this card is it gives your creatures mobility, so they can fly across those ocean tiles, take clears on the other side of the map. Uh, it's just a very good way to make a creature mobile, and if it survives, it gets to transform back to the Rakoan it was. Now, I would probably use this on some of the weaker Rakoans, like the one ones, unless you're pretty certain the Dune Drake's not going to die because you don't want to lose that Rakoan as well. So you can get good value at this, but I think the biggest concern with this card is it's a bit of a high risk, high reward. In some situations, sure, you get the 4-4 June Drake and it can do some work, but if your opponent has an answer to that June Drake, you may lose a Cohen that has some value to you, like maybe a War Machine or um, maybe a Champion. So you need to be careful. You need to time your Illusionist 
in order to make sure it's a safe play and also to make sure that you get the most out of it. So this card takes a bit of timing, but I still like it. Very unique effect, very cool. Now, Rakoan Copter, this is a Blazing Salamander, but a very mobile one. It's a Flying Dash one, so it can move into those positions and deal an AoE damage of deal two damage to adjacent enemy creatures. So everything next to it will take two damage. And I've been using this outside of Rakoan Dex. I think this is just a really solid card. Uh, in the right meta, this can really do a lot of work. Against, say, Yellow Rush, for example, followers, salmons, monks, they're all going to die to this. So I'm a really solid card on its own. Also has a Rakoan tribe as well. So that's also a benefit if you want to use some of the other Rakoan synergies that I've mentioned in the previous cards. So very solid. If you just want some removal, want a bit of mobility, I pick up this card for your deck. Now last but not least, the card that pulls the whole Rakoan subtype together. This is a Rakoan champion. It's a free wildland, so it has the flexibility to be played quite easily. As you can see, the Rakoans do spread across a lot of different colors, and they only cost one, so it's quite easy to get them out. So the Rakoan Champion, as a wild creature, is very good and neutral as well, so it can be summoned anywhere. It has dash too, has great mobility, so it can move into offensive or defensive positions. And it gains plus one, plus one for each other friendly Rakoan in play. Now we've already seen a lot of cards that spawn additional Rakoans. Rakoan Recruiter, the Shield Mates. So there are ways to get this down and uh, get some good power on it. I think it's really good at a 7-7. You basically get a uh, Colossus out of it for 5 Feria. That's really solid. Uh, you can play it for Tempo as well if you just want to put... A decent body down. A 5 fear of 4 4 is not great, but a 5 fear of 5 5 is not bad. 5 fear of 6 6 I think is pretty good. 5 fear of 7 7 I think that's the money. If you can get to a 7 7, you've got very good value out of this card. So just a really solid, kind of tempo orientated finisher for the Rakoans. Um, I like this card a lot. Good solid synergy with the whole archetype, um, the whole archetype and the subtype, and it's got mobility as well, so you can move it into those positions to set up whatever plays you plan to make in the future. So that wraps up the Rakoans. I'm going to split this into parts. So we're going to do the Rakoans first. Uh, I really like the Rakoan subtype. I hope we see more Rakoans in the future. I, I'd really like to see some expansion on the Rakoans and different win conditions. Right now we have the champion. I'd like to see something else, maybe along the lines of Cannoneer and Illusionist, where you maybe sacrifice a Rakoan and gain something from it. That's what I'd like to see in the future, but overall very happy with the Rakoan subtype. Up next we have the Yak subtype. Uh, these uh, new Yaks that have been added to the game to basically create... Uh, a new subtype for them. I have played a deck with these guys. They're very cool, but they're also quite good standalone cards in some situations as well. Uh, but first off, we'll take a look at the Topaz Yak. Now, the Topaz Yak is very good. I'm a big fan of this card. It's a 4 Feria, 1 Desert, 4 2. Can be summoned next to friendly Yaks. If it is, it gains haste. So think of a Wind Soldier in some respects. It's a bit, bit like Wind Soldier, a bit like Ninja Toad, if you can get the haste off. Has great synergies with Sapphire Yak, so if it collects off your opponent's well, you're able to gain plus two, plus two. And I think that's one of the, the biggest pros of this card. I'll quickly just show the Sapphire Yak as well. So whenever a fr friendly Yak harvests Feria from an enemy well, it gains plus two, plus two. So the Topaz Yak starts off as a 4-2. Four attacks very good, challenges a lot of the solid four drops in the game, like the Herald of War, um, like the um, <laughs> the Mace Man and the Triton Warriors of the world. So great at that straight away. Also, we can gain that additional power up. Might live to tell the tale, which is also very good. Gaining that plus two life, bringing it up to four life. But six attack, which means you can clear Grand Shakers and stuff like that. So Topaz Yak, just a very solid removal option for any kind of Yak subtypes in your deck. And just has very good synergy with a Sapphire Yak. And it's probably going to die, so it's going to synergize with the Mother of Old Yaks. So very good card. Big fan of this one. Ruby Yak. 5 area 1 mountain, whenever a friendly yak is dealt damage, deal 1 damage to your opponent, it's a 4-5. So very solid body, 
for five theory. As you can see just here, Warjak has a very similar stat line for five for five theory. So whenever a friendly yak is dealt damage, deal one damage to your opponent. So this yak creates a bit of pressure on your opponent's life when your yaks are in combat and you can just chip away at them. It doesn't have a lot of synergy with the yak subtype really. Uh, not that I've seen so far. I think this deck, uh, sorry, this card benefits decks that have a bit more burn in it or maybe want to go for some combo. Uh, I've seen players using famine. So play a lot of ruby yaks, go for a few famine to set up lethal. So there's a few combo opportunities with this card. It's got solid stats, so it's still a pretty decent yak. But when I built my yak deck, I felt like this was the weakest in terms of the subtype. But it definitely has potential with other cards and in other archetypes. So maybe not the strongest yak, but still plenty of potential in this card. Sapphire Yak, I would even argue to say this is the best Yak of them all. Uh, Topaz Yak follows up from this uh, because of the synergy. So Sapphire Yak, 4 Feria, 1 Lake. Whenever a friendly Yak harvests from a Feria from an enemy well, it gives it plus 2, plus 2. So the creature that collects, that is a Yak, will gain the power up. Now, it's a 2-4. Pretty durable. 4 Feria. 4 Feria for a 2-4 is not great, but this ability can get out of hand very quickly and it has a lot of synergies with stuff like Topaz Yak and the other Yaks that are going to be collecting off your enemy well but what's really crazy about this card is it stacks with other copies of Sapphire, uh, Sapphire Yak so if you have multiple Sapphire Yaks down you will trigger this multiple times so the more Sapphire Yaks you have down the more power these Yaks are going to gain when they collect off the enemy well this is crazy because these yaks could grow really big and if this yak is saying double collection it's going to start growing itself and it's going to become more durable and harder to kill which means it's got a bigger chance of collecting off the enemy well again. So Sapphire Yak definitely a card that can snowball if it's not checked which is why I rate it as one of the probably the most strongest yak in the game right now because of its snowball potential. Very good card, great synergy with the subtype, and multiple Sapphire Yaks cause lots of problems. Now Emerald Yak. Emerald Yak is a free fairy, one forest, give summon a 1-1 one, one baby yak, very cute, with taunt, can't harvest fairy, but you have to summon it on a neutral tile, so you cannot summon it on special lands, it must be summoned on neutrals. I feel that this is one of the weaker yaks of the new ones. I feel Ruby Yak is a little bit stronger because it's a bit more durable, but doesn't have the kind of subtype synergy. This has more of a subtype synergy because it creates additional yaks to die, which synergizes with the mother of all yaks. But the big thing that holds this back is the fact that the yak has to be summoned on neutral, so it means you have to build neutral tiles in order to summon this creature's additional yak. So it's not bad, it's a free free gets flame burst it's free ferrier that's a trade in ferrier that's not too bad uh the one one if you get to summon it you gain some value but because it doesn't collect ferrier it doesn't really have a lot going on so you can't power it up with the sapphire yak it still synergizes with the ruby yak it still synergizes with the topaz yak uh, but yeah i don't know it's it's okay it's not bad it's not great but does have synergies with Mother of All Yaks, which I quite like, and can enable the Topaz Yak to get in some good positions. Now, last but not least, the win condition of the Yak subtype Mother of All Yaks, a 15 Feria 5 8, gift, summon 2 4 for Yak Guards with Taunt and flying adjacent to the Mother of the Yaks, costs one less for each friendly Yak that has died this game. Now, this card generates a lot of value. You get a lot of creatures a lot of stats for its cost. Now you do need to reduce it to get that value with Yaks dying. In a Yak subtype that's not going to be too difficult. Now I feel... So the, the one thing with cards like this, you've got to determine how much fairy are you willing to invest to get a return from it. And what I mean by that, the stats and the creatures that it generates, or the ability, power level. What power level is this at to get a return for the fairy invested? Now I feel that 8 Feria is really good. Like, 
If you can get this down to 8 Fairy and pay 8 for it, I think you're happy. Anything lower than that is even better, but I think 8 Fairy for me is like the benchmark of really good value. I wouldn't mind paying 10 Fairy for this, but 10 Fairy is using a lot of resources and there must be a situation where Mother of All Yaks can come down and you'll be in a good place. Luckily it's very durable and it does summon taunts. So 10 Fairy I feel like is where you're happy to spend. Like that's that's a good happy meet. That's a good happy compromise. Ten Feria, get a good body, get a couple of taunters out as well. These can all collect Feria as well. That's another thing to consider. But eight Feria, I think, is the sweet spot. If you pay for eight, you're getting good value. Anything lower, it's just it's Christmas. You're, you're having the time of your life. So yeah, I'm I'm a big fan fan of this win condition. It just puts a lot of stats down, a lot of trouble for your opponent to deal with. Uh, the Mother of all Yaks is bulky, so it's uh, going to take a while to kill. It has taunters to protect it, and then it also synergizes with all the other Yaks we've seen. Uh, it can enable Topaz Yak to come down and do some work. It can collect Feria, so Sapphire Yak can buff it even further, pushing it up to, say, like a 710. So great synergy with the, um, the subtype altogether. And like I said, you can get great value out of it depending on its reduction. So that wraps up the Yaks. I feel the Yaks, I feel that they need a few more cards. Hopefully we'll see some more in the future. But I feel there's definitely the birth of a great subtype here. Uh, it does have potential now. Like I said, I would like to see a couple more Yaks to go with it. But overall, very happy with the direction of the Yaks so far. All right, we're down to the final few cards of the Fall of Everlife. Let's kick things off at the top this time. Hunt down. Free Feria, one forest, two wild. Give a friendly beast plus two attack. Then it fights an enemy creature. Now we all know how powerful Frog Tosser is. Imagine giving your beasts a Frog Tosser ability. So you get to hit creatures from afar. Very powerful card. Definitely opened up the beast subtype, which was another subtype that was kind of... Just expanded upon. The beast didn't exist before Fall of Everlife because subtypes were only introduced, but they didn't need a lot already because there were a lot of beasts in the game to start off with. Very strong. It's basically opened up green and blue, really, to have a lot of removal options. Uh, green, blue has always been quite a good deck since the Oversky. Now it has a new direction. Uh, the last kind of strongest blue green deck we had was the jump that was made by xged now i think the beasts have taken over uh, there's lots of good value to be had with the beast uh, uh, subtype like mystic beast is good value uh ancient boar but now you have removal you can combo removal with it so just giving that subtype a great removal option to co uh, already combine with some of its other removals like the deepwood stalker and the frog tosser so definitely open up green blue back into a very strong competitive state i'm sure you guys have seen this card a lot already beasts have really picked up in popularity on ladder if you've watched my beast video i did soon kichi's blitz uh, deck i had four beast mirror matches for that video so just goes to show how popular that archetype has become so yeah hunt down very good card probably one of the best cards of the set Maginata, Spirit of Everlife, 10 Feria, 2 Forest, 3 Wild, Protection Divine, Gift, a friendly creature swallows it, it gains plus 5, plus 5, flying and charge 2. Now, this card's weird. I must admit, I'm, I'm not quite sold on it, and I will be honest, I haven't really tried it out, and I haven't seen much of it. Now, the, the biggest problem I have with Maginata is Tefra's kind of similar. And I kind of like Tefra more. Tefra, Tefra itself is a very strong creature because of its mobility. We, we've all seen how good Garadan is. Garadan has a great ability, but it's a 6-6 six, six flying charge too. I like its mobility. It's a, it can collect Feria. It's got a good body. Maginata is a 5-5. Five, five. I would like to see a 6-5 so it can challenge Ground Shakers and stuff like that. It does get protection, it does get divine. Divine kind of hinders it because you can't power it up. And it's in green, right? Green... I feel like green wants a bit of divine, to be honest. Uh, but maybe not in this card. And 
For me, I feel this is kind of like a win condition. You pay 10 Feria to give your creature mobility and a power up, and then you hit your opponent. Now, it has a wild land cost, so it is kind of open to being splashed into a few other decks. I'm not sold on it, which is why I haven't used it. Maybe I need to get into the lab with this card and see where it lies, but I think the problem for me is like its ability doesn't really scream anything out to me. It doesn't say, oh, this fits in this deck, or oh, this has synergy with this card. It, it's kind of like, here's a power-up, here's a creature after the power-ups after the creature who got powered up's died. For me, too much like Tefra, and I really like Tefra. So being able to replace Tefra is very difficult for me personally. So Maginata, I would like to hear your guys' thoughts on this. If you've made any decks with this card in, how do you feel about it? I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say. All right. Rapala, the dope fish. This card, this card is hilarious. Okay, one fairy, uh, one lake, one fairy, a free wild, aquatic creature, gift. Fill your opponent's hand with ruby fish. What an idiot. Now you'd think, why would I want to fill my opponent's hand with ruby fish? It's just really awkward. It's just such an awkward card to play against. I have played against it myself, and if you'd seen my recent video this week, my blue-red Rapala control, I've caused problems for my opponent with this card in combination with Storyteller. The thing is, this card goes even further. Now, I thought the Storyteller combo, you know, it's one of the more obvious combos for the card. It was pretty, pretty cool, pretty good. No, 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 no. This, this card can go even further into meme territory. S of Dawn has created almost like a one-turn kill mill deck. Now, I'm going to feature this deck next week. I'm going to need to practice with it first because there's a lot of moving pieces. But basically, the deck involves Rapala. So you play Rapala, fill your hand, opponent's hand with Rubyfish. You play Ring of Fish, make a lot of fish on the board. You play Hunted Outlaw. Let me just get Hunted Outlaw up just in case you guys don't know about this card. Because you don't see Hunted Outlaw a lot. It's mainly Superb Lizard who has played this card in the past. Uh, but Hunted Outlaw. So let's take a look at this. Last word, your opponent draws a card against Tuferia. So you play the Ruby Fish, uh, you play the Rapala, fill your opponent's hand up, you play the Ring of Fish, you fill your board up with fish. You then play the Hunted Outlaw, Hunted Outlaw comes down. You then play Fugoro, and Fugoro use, use the Medallion. Now the Medallion transforms all the creatures you control uh, into one creature that you control. That's a bit of a weird way to word it. But basically, you choose one of your creatures and every other creature you control becomes that creature. You turn all your creatures into Hunted Outlaws. And then you play Doomsday. And Doomsday, if you don't know what Doomsday is, again, another card we don't see that much anymore. Doomsday just kills everything. Now what this does is your opponent has a hand full of, Repo uh, r full of ruby fish. And then, when all your Hunted Outlaws die, they draw cards. Now, because their hand is full, they will burn the card, because you can't have more than nine cards in your hand. If you don't, it just goes to the graveyard, or just it just dies. It doesn't exist anymore. And then, your opponent just burns and burns and burns and burns and burns and burns, gains tons of Feria, but you push them into mill territory and you kill them. So this deck is quite grindy, but yeah. That's basically the strategy. You, it's a lot, like I said, a lot of moving pieces. You pull all these combo pieces together and then you mill your opponent out. And I will feature this deck next week. Essadorn messaged me with the deck. I'd already seen him play it. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, this is crazy stuff. So Rapala, very cool card, very unique, very creative. I like it a lot. Maybe not too competitive, but definitely opens up some fun. All right, Orphan Fugu, another addition to the beast subtype. Four Feria, one lake, one wild, very flexible because green has a lot of beasts. Uh, it is a beast, has plus two, plus zero, and jump while you control another beast. So it's a free five on its own for four Feria, which is okay. But comes a five five for four Feria if you control another beast. Great synergy with the beast subtype. Uh, it also helps Ancient Ball. So Ancient Ball reduces the cost of that down to three. Gets jump, becomes very mobile. Also with Hunt Down, it becomes a 7 attack if you control the other beast. So it can kill Verdun Force. Or it can kill a creature and live to tell the tale. Very strong beast. Kind of 
does what it says on the tin. Oh, kind of like an overstated four cost, but you need a beast in play. So you, you need to build your deck around it, which I can appreciate definitely for this whole subtype thing. So great. I'm a big fan. Now this is this is one of the most surprising cards from the expansion for me. A 12 fairy, uh, sorry, a 4 fairy, 2 mountain, 3 wild, 12 attack, 3 life, no text, just a big body. Not even a big body, just a big attacker. So this has already great synergy with the hate mechanic or the angry mechanic with the hate seeds and the fire bringers. It's kind of like a... It's, it's, it's just interesting. It's, it's very, very strong. It, it's 12 attack. It hits like a truck. It's like Red's answer to Furrying Golem. <laughs> like, Havoc doesn't quite do it. So now they have Lava Surge to, uh, to bump it up. And yeah, this, this card's name. Axo, Axolotl? Axolotl? Not a word I'm familiar with, but yeah, Lava Surge, as I just call it. I really want to experiment this card in the angry archetype. I feel it has a lot of potential there. Just like a 4 fairy win condition. And I think that's where it stands. It either acts as a 4 fairy win condition where you just dump it down and say, have an answer to this or you're going to die. Or you play it in response to some big, big creatures. So a good way for red to tech against green, I feel. Mono green Beastmaster picks up again when those fiery and golems become a problem. This Lava Surge can check it. Alright, so Lionfish, Free Fairy, 1 Desert, 0 for Flying Death Touch. So, one thing to note about Death Touch is you cannot trigger Death Touch's ability if you have no attack. So, if this creature has no attack, it cannot kill other creatures with its ability. Which seems kind of strange, right? But the Flying Archetype has ways to give this attack. You can also use Power Ups as well from Green. This is only one desert. Very easy to splash this card in. Reminds me a little bit of the Piranha. But it needs a little bit of work to get going. So Drakkar Sky Captain, definitely a card to consider if you're playing Lionfish. I actually feel this gives yellow flyers and maybe even yellow control a kind of durable threat. It reminds me of Sturdy Shell with a little bit extra. So I, I can I, I like this card. You know, it, it's cool. It, it has a bit of build around. It can collect fairy. It's flying, so we can just move across the ocean. Not as restrictive as Sturdy Shell, but costs a little bit more and not as strong in the life. So yellow gets kind of its own Sturdy Shell. I, I can respect that. It gets powered up from the Drakkar Sky Captain. It gets powered up from the Avery, the structure that gives the flyers plus one attack. So there's definitely a lot of potential for you. I've seen this in Yellow Flyer builds and it has been a problem for me. So I look forward to experimenting with this card in the future. I like it a lot. But last but not least, uh, the card that I was most excited for at first when I saw this ex uh, half of the expansion, Ghost Dragon. Free Farrier, two desert, six attack, zero life. Flying, charge two protection. So the obvious way to get this card online is to power it up. The best way to do that is through the Drakkar Sky Captain. So this has direct synergy with the Drakkar Sky Captain. When you draw this card with Drakkar's on board, it gains that life so you can play it. And it becomes just a really good King's Faithful, I guess you could say. Uh, it'll have like maybe one or two life, but it has mobility, it has flying, it has protection. I think this card's very good when it when it gets online, when it gets that life. And as a 7-1, it can kill a lot of things. Very solid card. Now, if you haven't seen it already, check out my Ghost Dragon one turn kill. The other synergy this card has is with the Shaitan Monstrosity. So when a creature dies, Shaitan Monstrosity gains attack. Shaitan Monstrosity is a 0-5. I'll quickly get him up a minute. So what you do, if you haven't seen my video, is you play your Shaitan Monstrosities and then you play Ghost Dragons with zero life and they die and then it powers up the Monstrosity. So it's essentially plus six attack to your Shaitan Monstrosity for free Feria and you can set up all sorts of shenanigans. One turn kills, uh, big clears, very cool. I really liked that about Ghost Dragon and direct synergy with this card. I've always been a big fan of this but never really had enough to get it going. I feel like Ghost Dragon gives Monstrosity 
some real power and it makes it a real threat if you can build the right deck for it. But definitely check that out, my Ghost Dragon OTK, if you want to see how these two cards synergize together. One of the that's why I was so excited about this card. I was like, oh my god, Sheet of Monstrosity has some support now, and it's really good. Like, 9 Faria, give Shade of Monstrosity 18 attack. It's in yellow. We have Flashwind, we have Kaleem's training. So many ways to kill your opponent. So fantastic, really big fan of the Ghost Dragon, and just really big fan of this expansion overall. I, I feel like the second part is definitely my favourite, because it brings in a lot of opportunities to build new decks with the subtypes so I felt the first part of the expansion uh, kind of reinforced pre-existing archetypes but yeah that is it for this card review and that concludes this card review for part two of Fall of Everlife what a fantastic expansion I must say I'm a, I'm a big fan of this expansion it opened up new doors to new decks I love tribes or subtypes as they're called inferior big fan of tribal decks across a lot of card games so I'm, I'm really happy to see Raccoons and see the Yaks and the Beasts. I can't wait to see more Raccoons and Yaks in the future. I really like to see them pushed, given alternate win conditions, alternate cards to control the board with. We also got some really cool cards like the Ghost Dragon, uh, Rapala is just crazy. I can't wait to show you guys that one turn kill mill deck that S of Dawn created. So fantastic expansion guys if you are new to Feria, i know there's a lot of cards already in existence with the core set and the oversky that come with the standard game so there's a lot to explore already but when you're ready definitely dive into fall of everlife there are some really cool cards there there are actually a lot of really cool cards lots of different ways to expand your decks and create new archetypes and you know what's even crazier we're getting new cards this month it's September already and we're going to be getting even more cards. So these archetypes and that have been and these new cards are going to have more support come in the future very soon. So we're going to have more exciting additions come to Fairy, and I hope you guys are excited about that too. I still have so much work to do with this. I have so many decks to try and I, I'm a, I am such a big fan of deck building and experimenting. So it's a lot of fun for me and I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, my content with the fall of everlife will it work to so become a god big fan like i said of developing new decks and i can't wait to show you some of my other ideas i have in the future if you like this video be sure to give it a thumbs up if you haven't already drop a subscribe to keep up to date of when our content goes live you can check out our my first card review part one these are kind of that was a bit more of a i guess you could say a knee jerk kind of review i kind of reviewed the cards as they came out because like i said they look like they just expanded on pre-existing archetypes they didn't um generally offer like a lot of new archetypes out of them whereas this part you know busted the doors wide open there's just so much to do and so much to build and experiment with so yeah be sure to check that out as well and of course there's all my will it works and my become a gods if you'd like to see you know my journey through the expansions trying out the top players decks i feature decks from players like Sunkichi, happy joe captain g s of dawn like all these top players i've been featuring decks from them but also my own creations and my own ideas uh, so yeah you can check them out as well so until next time guys take care and i hope you enjoyed my fall of everlife card review